And I want to ask a question this morning. Uh, I, I remember as a, uh, probably as a uh, young man, 22, maybe 24, 25 years, maybe even before I got married, before I was 21. I remember a song, a song pop group at that time, uh, used to say, what's love got to do with it? And 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 I, I, I it's, a, it's a good question. I guess but what does love have to do with it? But the other I want to ask another question this morning. What does love look like? Don't answer now. We have enough time. But what does love look like? We use the word quite loosely sometimes. And, uh, and we probably define love by action, don't we? Love is, a, is an abstract concept, but it's not an, an inactive one. Someone should write that down, because I'm not going to remember that anymore. <laughs> what I how, how do you define love? Tom will look at his beautiful wife and say, I love you. She'll say, show me. So the next day, Tom comes with a big bouquet of roses. It's, it's, it's a demonstration, right? Or a, uh, an invitation out to a nice, fine restaurant to dine. Here's my question this morning. What does God's love look like? Think about it. What does God's love look like? How many have found Romans chapter 5 verse 8? It simply says this is profound. But God, the old King James Version says, commend us. It means approve. I've given final evidence of his love towards us. In that, while we were yet sinners, if that phrase is not underlined in your Bible, do it right now. I mean, that phrase should be underlined in every Bible in this house this morning. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Let that sink in for a moment. While we were blaspheming, while we were ignorant towards, while we were neglecting off, while we were abusive to, Someone who's always calling me and telling me how great a preacher I am. How wonderful a pastor I am. How I'm always filling me with these great thoughts. And naturally as an individual, there is a warmness in my heart towards someone who is so encouraging and so observant and so correct. <laughs> <laughs> but then the phone call comes in. And I'm ripped apart. I am abused. I am, I am made lower than the slime underneath grade A in the gravel pit. I am made to be, I am lied about, I am falsely portrayed, I am, and they hang up the phone. You get the picture, don't you? My immediate reaction, not one of great love and appreciation and thanking God for this phone call. Oh Lord, I couldn't have made it through the day without this phone call. No. No, my first reaction is I'm blowing fire like the bull. I'm snorting at my nostrils. I'm going through all the reasons why nothing that person said to me was right. 
And I'm kind of looking at God and saying, God, you could have stopped that and you didn't. So God, if you are choosing not to get even, I will. And I got a few ways to do it. <laughs> love is not on my mind. And love certainly isn't one of them. But here in this text it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we abuse God and abuse God and abuse God. And what's his response? He gives his son. And then we, he sends his son and we abuse him and we abuse him and we abuse him and then we put him to death. And he says, Father, forgive them. What does God's love look like? I, I present to you this morning this, this truth that Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of the, of the Father's love. But let's, let's take a little journey this morning and, and put that into real, into real life context. It's interesting, educators, and we have a number of them in our congregation, educators say this, that we retain 30% of what we hear. We retain 60% of what we hear and see. And we retain 80% of what we hear, see, and do. And that observation is going to be significant in a little while as I share the Word of God with you this morning. So what does love look like? When we see somebody holding hands, is that love? Maybe. But it might be lust, or perversion, or simply friendship. One of the interesting things I first learned when I went to Africa, and, uh, and all my African brethren and sisters here will understand what I'm saying. Uh, so I, I went to to, uh, with, to do, I did a, a conference in Africa in 1999 uh, that covered something like seven different, uh, several different countries, spending most of my time in, 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 in Zambia. And uh, I was briefed by a good friend of mine who was a missionary. He said, now when you see the brothers holding hands, uh, there's nothing funny going on. Because <laughs> when I see the brothers holding hands over here, <laughs> in downtown Toronto, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Right? So, uh, in Africa, and uh, how, how many, how many understand, how many of my brothers here this morning from, from, from Africa continent understand? Right on, exactly, exactly. And it, it, it's an expression of, of friendship. We are friends, we're walking together, and we pray together, and we encourage one another, we care for one another's families, and we take responsibility for each other. It's a, it's a marvelous concept, a marvelous concept. So it could be simply friendship. When we see someone doing good things, is that love? Maybe. But it might be manipulation or misguided motivation. When we hear someone say, I love you, is that love? Maybe. But it might be a strategy for personal gain. It's a great line for marriage counseling and pre-marital counseling. And young people. What does love look like? Well, you ask a hundred people and you'll probably get a hundred different answers. If you ask a sick person what does love look like, they say, it's a kind and thoughtful deed that someone did for me. Well, I'm in my sickness. You ask a lonely teenager, and that teenager, him or her, will say to you, it's, it's someone who will give them their time. I love you enough and care about it enough that though there are other things on my agenda, I'm sitting aside the afternoon to spend with you. Give me your time. If you ask a parent what love is, it's a son or a daughter who cares enough to stay in touch. You ask a child what love is, and they may answer, it's a parent who is always there to support and encourage. So can love be defined? My answer to you is yes, this morning, it can be defined. But it's got to be defined within a context. It's, it's not just a, a wishy-washy uh, definition from Webster's. As good as Webster's is, sis. 
it's got to be defined within the context of two things, sacrifice and forgiveness. See, it is, it is our love for our spouses that allow us to have the capacity to forgive and not hold against. It's our love for our fellow worker that, that allows us to uh, forgive that person and not hold against them. Then in the context of sacrifice, it is love that causes us to, to, to sacrifice even if we don't get anything back in return. Isn't that true with Calvary? Many rejected him. He still loved them. And he loved them to the end. So love can only be defined in the context of sacrifice and forgiveness. The one who truly loves will be prepared to sacrifice and forgive when that sacrifice has been slighted or offended. Actually, husbands and wives, we, need, we, we really do need to revisit our, our vows. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. That's 16 spouses we're allowed to have. Four, four, four better and four poor. Four rich and four poor. In sickness and in health. Man, I tell you, as a pastor, I have never seen that principle so tested in my life to see it now. I've seen couples who who have just went through life without a without a, a health issue. I've seen couples who have went through life with like everything going for them and I've had a wonderful. But then I have seen and have worked with couples. And in the natural it's heartbreaking to see to see a man uh, nursing his wife, his wonderful, beautiful wife, uh, as as you would nurse uh, a, a child. And you will see him sacrificing his very life to give her what basic comfort she can needs during this incredible, hopeless situation. And it was only just a couple of weeks ago I walked into one, I, was in, I encountered one of those situations and, I, and I, I, afterwards I made this comment, Oh my Lord, when we stand at the, at the, at the altar with our, our, our mate for life, and we make this vow in sickness and in health for rich or for poor. You are mine. So I'm going to tell you something. We're in an age where you need to love somebody to stand true to that principle. And that love begin with a love for Christ and a love that's been communicated to one another because look, I don't know what tomorrow holds. My wife don't know what tomorrow holds. Maybe she will have to nurse me. Maybe she'll have to feed me with a bottle. Maybe she'll have to change my diapers. <laughs> that's the reality of it. Maybe I won't be able to show her love back. Maybe I won't be able to communicate to her. Maybe I won't be able to do nothing. We just lie there as an invalid. And the love of God in her for me because of our commitment to one another keeps her coming back and treating me like a child which I'm going to love but I can't say thank you. That's the reality. That's the reality. Love is, 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 is an incredible force. And it's not something to be said lightly. It's not something to be thought of lightly. It's, it's, it's always within the context of sacrifice and forgiveness. See, in John 3.16, you don't need to go there because you know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish that everlasting life. Yet while we were in our sins, He died for us. The text says, while we were sinners. How many people, come on, have look at them. How many people have we kind of held at bay because we didn't know we were trust them? Because of their lifestyle. Because of, we just held them out there. And we would, actually what we did was withheld, withhold our love from them because we didn't want to And we weren't prepared to expose ourselves. And we couldn't take the risk. Just think of the risk that Jesus took when he came down for us bunch of sinners and he died, he died, he died for all mankind. Think about it for a moment. He risked everything. Everything. 
It, it's easy to read 5 and 8 of Romans. It's easy to read 3 and 6 and the John and, and then just keep on going. And so as we read these two verses and, and, and a multiplied by many of others, we hear what the love of God looks like. We hear what it looks like. God for the way he came. For while we were yet in our sins, he, he saved, he, he came and died for us. We, we hear that. But please allow me this morning to share the following true story so that you and I might see the love of God. There's something about hearing. Remember what they, 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 they said? If you hear, you'll retain 30%. If you hear and see, you retain 60%. Carla was a daughter of a prostitute. She began using dope at 8 and became a heroin addict at age 12. Like her mother, she turned to prostitution at age 14. And her already hardened heart became tougher as she experienced men who used her young body to fulfill their sick lusts. From the start of her life, it seemed she didn't stand a chance. She was on downward spiral towards destruction. It seemed that nothing could stop her reckless lifestyle of hate, rebellion, and lawlessness. As foolhardy as her behavior was, few could imagine her degree of unrestraint. Her hot-headed, uncaring actions would eventually end her life. According to the prison records, in June 1983, 23-year-old Carla Faye Tucker and her boyfriend, Daniel Ryan Gillett, were both high on an array of drugs from a three-day binge. They sneaked into Jerry Dean's apartment to steal motorcycle parts. In what became a grisly confrontation, Garrett, Garrett used a hammer and Tucker used a pickaxe to kill Dean. When Deborah Thornton was found hiding beneath a blanket in Dean's room, Tucker rushed her and viciously swung the pickaxe into Deborah's body over and over again. Police reports state that both victims had more than 20 stabs or puncture wounds and the, and the pickaxe was found embedded in Thornton's chest. This inhumane act caused many to think that Carla Fay was without conscience, that she was a sociopath. If she felt remorse for her murders, few, if any, knew about it. Her heart was cold and fixed on doing whatever her carefree draw all her mind told her to do. On February 3, 1998, Carla was executed by lethal injection in perhaps one of the most highly publicized executions in the history of the United States. Highly publicized because she was the first woman since the middle of the Civil War to be put to death in the state of Texas. Also, up to the moment of her death, she expressed her remorse to the Thornton and Dean families and spoke of the changes Jesus Christ had made in her life. What happened to the tough, hateful Carla? Not long after Carla was incarcerated, 15 years before her death, Jonathan and Karen Gill had brought a puppet show to the Harris County Jail. Carla Faye recalls, all the women in my unit were going to the puppet show in the chapel. I didn't want to go, but I didn't want to be left alone either, so I thought I would go and just socialize with the other women. The second I walked through the door, I felt something. I knew now that it was the presence of God. Karen Gill had also spent time in jail and through the ministry called Teen Challenging Houston. Both she and Jonathan were helped and in turn became involved in ministry to those in the jail or prison. Through the puppet show, Karen communicated the love of God and the forgiveness she had found in Jesus Christ. Carla Fay said, These people were where, were where I had been. There was a glow about them, a peace that was so real. I wanted to have what they had. I wanted to feel what they felt. The evening of the puppet show, Carla Fay didn't speak to anyone. She watched, she listened, and for some reason she heard what the little, what the little puppets were saying. Strangely, toughness started to melt. She felt feelings she had never felt before, and she secretly took one of the three Bibles to her cell. She sat in the corner of her cell and started to read God's Word. I couldn't understand what I was reading, Carla said, but the next thing I knew, I was in the middle of the floor, on my knees, crying to God for forgiveness. At that time, I, I don't know if I felt forgiven, but I felt His love surround me like a cocoon. Her mind began thinking thoughts she had previously refused to accept. She felt that God was enabling her to face the heartless murders she had committed. In waves of emotion, she began to sob as the full impact of her crimes came over her. Even though she now understood her horrible actions and the helplessness of her life, she sensed God's presence in that jail cell. She said, the whole time, God was loving me. The message of the puppet ministry eternally impacted Carla. She unconditionally surrendered her life to Christ, and for 15 years she grew in her Christian faith. Now, some might say, that's convenient. She decided to pick up jailer's religion in order to gain clemency. 
She was so corrupt that she would even use God to save herself from the execution chamber. But those who knew Carla only speak of a changed person. Chapman Alexander Taylor, a regional program administrator for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, said she was a powerful witness for God for many years. It's difficult being a Christian in prison. If you're a fake, you'll be found out quickly. Chaplain Jerry Groom, administrator of the chaplaincy program for the Texas State uh, of Criminal Justice, said Carla's life expressed a tremendous sense of having received God's forgiveness and acceptance. She was repentant, dedicated to giving back to those from whom she had taken her life has forever impacted my life, he says, and inspires me to this day, Broom had it. Having walked to heaven's gate with Carla, I was left with a fresh appreciation of God's grace and power to transform. Jim Brazil, the chaplain who stayed with Carla Faye in the execution chamber, said in the midst of all the hardship and all the trials, she was the one encouraging everyone. The day before Carla's execution, knowing that Jim would speak at the funeral, Carla wrote an encouraging note to him and put it in his Bible. Jim said, I really it really blessed me and ministered to me in a way that I really needed at the time. Here is Carla Faye's last statement. I would like to say to all of you, the Thornton family, Jerry Dean's family, that I am so sorry. I hope God will forgive you with this, or I will give you peace with this. To her husband, she said, baby, I love you. And to Ron, a friend of the Thorntons, give Peggy a hug for me. Everybody has been so good to me. I love, I love all of you very much. I am going to be face to face with Jesus now in a few moments. Warden Beggett from the Mountain View Warden. Thank you all so much. You have been so good to me. I love all of you very much. I will see you all when you get there. I will wait for you. Carla Feta was written off by churches family, by the state, tossed into a prison for life. But the guilt family, walking in obedience to God, used his mission of God, walked in there with a puppet show. God didn't see a murderer in character. God saw an individual who needed salvation. For you see, we may not be murderers here today, we may have not taken a pickaxe. We may have not taken a shotgun. But every one of us was just as big a sinner as Carl's back. Yeah. We were born in sin. We were shaking me. Every one of us are the living expression of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. I want to ask this morning, how many adulterers are here? How many fornicators are here? How many doctors are here? How many thieves are here? How many, how, many, how many just vile people are here? I don't have that question. But I know this, that none of us were born saved. Every one of us had a personal decision to make to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of us, including this preacher, was going, getting well down the wrong road and headed for swift destruction when Jesus intercepted our lives. Maybe if we look this morning at ourselves, we will see the expression of the love of Jesus Christ. You see, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, not John, but 1 John, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Here, here, here's, here's one concern I have as a pastor. That time, that time provides us a, an unhealthy opportunity to forget where Jesus brought us from. We're all the products of God's grace. Every one of us. See, God's love provided redemption and salvation for a drug addict and a murderer of Carla Faye Tucker. God's love is big enough to forgive any sin from the found in humanity. When you see that person, when you hear the vileness, when you see the, what seems to be hopeless, never say, this person is hopeless. Always say, this person needs what I had and what I have and what I needed. His name is Jesus. You see, there is a, there is a I don't want to get into psychology this morning, but there is a psychological principle that flows over into the spiritual life where we forget where he brought us from. 
And all of a sudden, we have ourselves unintentionally, not intentionally, but unintentionally, we have ourselves on a little pedestal. <laughs> That's a 9.9. .9. We put ourselves on this pedestal in our minds that we're better than other people. And so when we see the old drunk, or we see the prostitute, or we, or we, we see the dysfunctional family, we just say, thank God we're not like that. Just like the guy, the Pharisee in the, in, the, in the temple. Thank God we're not like that. We're not like that. And then we wrap ourselves up in our neat little, in the, neat little routine and we trot along with life. And the downside of that, well, there's several downsides, but one downside of that is that we come to the house of God and we forget what God done for us. And we sit and we just sit in our spiritual pride and we just think, everything I got, God owes it to me. <coughs> That's right. And we'll sit sometimes, we won't worship. we we'll just go through the motions. And folk, we're in worse shape than the old drunk up down the streets. Because he don't know the truth. We know it and it's set us free and we've gone back to give up on that freedom. Amen. Amen. What does God's love do? If you could ask Carla Tucker, she would explain to you that God's love was the love that reached out through a lay couple who felt they must do something with puppets. But puppets, that's for kids, isn't it? Isn't it faster kid? <laughs> that makes sense for adults too, doesn't it? I mean, let's face it, let's be very honest with you. Who, who, who watched Sesame Street? <laughs> um, I did some fun, some fun at Ernie Burke for the cookies. <laughs> but what I really loved was the Muppet Show. <laughs> James Henson's Muppets. Well, it seems like, it seems like the puppet and the Muppet is good for, for all that. So why can't God use that? Yeah. See, some of us want to be that big time evangelist that sits stands before 12,000 people and gets this lofty introduction and then does his thing. And that's how we want to know. See, God uses whatever he gives in. That's what God, God's love is not restricted to the, 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 the rich and famous. It's restricted to those who will. Amen. Make themselves okay. It's very interesting, you see. We, uh, we, we, sticking with the psychology for a moment, we finally get to the point where we've forgotten who we were. We really do. And uh, uh, we, we, we see ourselves over and above other people. And what happens is we, we lose our appreciation for the miracle that God did in our lives. It's incredible. Uh, I, th I think it was Ike Newton, and it was was a, a, a slave trader and a rum runner, and he was the vilest of the vile. And in a vicious storm, uh, out somewhere in, in one of the big oceans of the world, uh, he finally surrendered his, 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 his life to the Lord and became uh, an incredible songwriter, an incredible preacher of the gospel of grace. And he had a he had a. In his office, he had a, a big plaque, and there was just one word. And he said, remember. I forget who it was that came to visit this day, and he said, we're, we're kind of curious about your, 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 your plaque that was one word on it. And he said, God, if I didn't remember, God just encouraged him to put that there as an always a reminder of what he was. A, a slave trader, a blagger, a blasphemous person, but the grace of God. Amen. And so he would say, I was a great sinner, but I met a great Savior. Amen. We must never forget that we were great sinners, but we met a great Savior. Amen. I met a great Savior. This is a very interesting in, in 1 Corinthians. Turn with me for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. See, God's love is big enough to forgive any sin from the sound of humanity. In fact, Paul's letter to the Corinthians was quite clear that the church was made up of such people. Listen to this. 
In 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, 11, listen to this. Now here's a bunch. Here's a bunch. Know ye not that the unrighteous, add up, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. If you're having sex or sort of marriage, you're a fornicator. Or adulterous. If you're having sex with someone that's not your spouse, you're an adulterer. Or idolaters. If you're putting something before God. Oh. Nor effeminate. Homosexual. That's what it means. But particularly in this case, it was referring to the male prostitutes of corn. Nor abused of themselves of mankind. Homosexuality expa expa expanded. Nor thieves. Nor covetous. Oh my goodness. We're getting pretty close to home. <laughs> nor drunkards. Nobody here like that, is there? <laughs> nor revilers. That's people who's always fault finding. Nor extortioners. People who's always working to, to, to disadvantage others for their, their own good. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to that verse. And such were some of you. And this morning, such were some of us. But listen to the love of God in action. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord, Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Wow. Every one of us is in that verse before we met Jesus. Before we met Jesus, we were in verse 10, 9, and 10. And thank God by His grace, we're in verse 11. See, this demonstrates that God's love is without measure. It cannot be measured for its height. It cannot be measured for its depth or breadth. Neither can it be measured against any other standard. Any other standard. Any other standard. Carla Faye Tucker was like many of us. Never knew Jesus. And, and, and got herself in, in under the power of sin in a life-destroying situation. And so we rejoice greatly in the incredible grace of God to reach into a prison house and bring a murderer out and forgive that murderer. Carlos Faye Tucker is the definition of what God's love looks like. It's a definition of what God's love. But what about the other side of the equation? What about pastor when I serve God and I fail God? Maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you're way out of relationship with Almighty God. But there was a time when you were zealous for Him. There was a time when you worked for Him. There was a time when you, you had consecrated all to Him. But you're, you're off track this morning. You're off track this morning. That's a possibility in many lives. Maybe today you're sitting here in this audience and you're listening and you're overwhelmed with guilt because of the sins of your past. And you're thinking that God will never forgive you and love you because of who you are and what you have done. I've had that said to me. I have been walking with people through the, the salvation process and through the introduction to the gospel process and all the, the nine steps and all the rest that we do. I only to have them look at me and say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. And I know some people use that just to get rid of the preacher. But I've had it said to me, and I knew the moment they said it. Whoa, whoa, there's been somewhere I've not been. I know by the way they said it. I know by the way they said it. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how badly I've let God down. You don't know. You don't know, preacher. You've lived a nice, tidy little life in your family, but I had all of it, and I turned my back on God. You don't know what I've been through. And you don't know how badly I've sinned. In other words, I'm not sure God can save me. I'm not sure God can forgive me for where I've gone. You may be here like that this morning. There's guilt because of, of the past. There's, there's, a, there's guilt because of, of, of your faith in God. And, and, and there's guilt because the enemy has said, look, look, God's love has a limit. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's love does not have a limit. 
I'm here to say this morning on the authority of God's word that in hell, God will love you. When you're lost and abandoned to hell, when you're gone and got no hope for eternity, God will still love you. I want you to hear that. Hell will just be as real and torment for eternity on to eternity, but God will still love you. But you made a choice. You made a choice. You made a choice. I'm glad this morning to report that God is the God of second chance. Amen. You're looking at a preacher who is a product of God's second chance. I served the Lord. As a young person, I, I got away from God. And my life was on a fast track to destruction. And he arrested me. And I'll never forget the night he arrested me. I won't go there now. But he put a wall in front of my face and I knew if I walked through that wall and past that wall that I would be walking into a lost eternity. But God had done everything in his power without breaking my right of personal will. He arrested me. Because he loved me. He didn't let me go. Others had to be tagged as being the, the bad one. And they were right. Others had to be tagged as not having any hope. And they were right. They were right until I encountered God. My dream friends, who were part of my family, when I got saved in November, were first of all very disappointed because Christmas was coming and I wasn't going to be out of bed with them. <laughs> so my brother-in-law said to my brother, don't worry about it. He'll be back living before Christmas. We'll have him again to drink. <laughs> well, today my brother-in-law and my brother for many, many years have been powerful believers and done a great work for God. You see, they underestimated the grace of God to bring a sinner back. How many of you here this morning, just quickly, you're, 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 you're the product of second chance. Look at that. After this audience, you're a product. Give the Lord praise. You're a product You may be here this morning. You may be under the burdens. The devil is saying, see, you can't make it. You sinned. You failed. Look, and you've lived in that sin for a while. And it's getting, and you know, you know, you know, you, you're just not going to make it. He's a liar. He's a father of lies. And I know that we realize that. God is the God of the prodigal. God is the God of the prodigal. I was a prodigal. You may be here this morning as a prodigal. He, he is the God of the prodigal. Let me begin to pull this to a close. And in doing so, I want to read another story. For you Newfoundlanders, it's time to fill out our homes. He was a great storyteller. In our comments. This morning, I don't usually have two stories in one message. But I believe it's a good illustration. You're here this morning. You're away from God. And you're running from God. And you're away from where you were. And God has his hand upon your life. And God has a call upon your life. And God, and God has done something in your life. And you've turned your back on God. And now you're feeling the burden of it. And you're, and you're, you're struggling with the lie of the enemy. That is too late. Let me explain something to you. Years ago, two young couples from the Philadelphia church in Stockholm, Sweden, answered God's call to be missionaries to the Belgian, to the Belgian Congo in Africa. When David and Siva Flood and Joel and Bertha Erickson arrived at the mission station in 19, 1921, they literally hacked their way with machetes into the interior. They finally reached the village. But the people said, we can't allow any white people here or our gods will be offended. At the next village, they were also rejected. The weary families had no choice. They settled in the jungle and built mud huts. Soon they were plagued with loneliness, malnutrition, and sickness. About six months uh, later, the Ericsons, the Ericsons decided to return to the mission station. But Siva couldn't travel because she was pregnant with her second child and had malaria. For several months, Siva, flood, endured a raging fever. During that time, she witnessed to a little boy who came from a nearby village to sell chickens. He also brought fruit for the family. As Siva spoke to him, he simply smiled. She didn't know if he understood the message of Jesus Christ that she tried to communicate to him. Siva delivered a healthy baby girl on April the 13th, 1923. Oh, but then we, she was at the point of death. In her final moment, she whispered to her husband, Name our baby, Ania. 
Sheba died 17 days after Aeneas' birthday. David made a casket. It's her husband. And in a grave on the mountainside, he buried his beloved wife. As he stood beside her grave, he looked down at his two-year-old son, David Jr. Then he heard his baby daughter's cries from the mud hut. Bitterness began to fill his heart. He flew, flew into a rage, crying, Why did you allow this, God? My wife was so beautiful. She's so talented. She's such a soloist in the Philadelphia Church in Stockholm. And she, now she lies dead at the age of 27. I have two-year-old son. He's telling God all this. I can't hardly care for him, let alone a baby girl. After more than a year in this jungle, all I have to show for it is one little village boy who probably doesn't understand what Shiva told him. David Flood hired some tribesmen as guides and took his children to the mission station. When he saw the Ericsons, he blurted their hand, I'm leaving. I'm taking my son with me back to Sweden. I'm leaving my daughter here with you. When David arrived in Stockholm, he went into the import business. He warned those around him never to mention God in his presence. Eventually, he began drinking heavily. Shortly after David and the son left, and within three days of each other, the Ericsons died. Some suspected poisoning. Little Lania was given to an American Assemblies of God missionary couple, Arthur and Anna Berg. The Bergs took Ania to a village called Masaya in northern Congo. They called her Agnes. And, and, and her nickname was Aki. Alone much of the time, Aki played games of imagination. She imagined she had brothers and sisters that even gave them names. She played with the African children that spoke Swahili. When the birds returned to the United States, they brought Aki with them. She had been born in the Congo of Sweden parents and had only a birth certificate with no evidence of Swedish citizenship and no Congolese citizenship. She was given a six months alien visa to enter America and for many years the Berg had to travel to Canada to renew Aggie's visa and didn't re-enter the United States. Aggie was a girl without a country. Many years later after Aggie was married to an American and had her own family she was unable to become a U she was able rather to become a U.S. citizen. Over and over Aggie tried to put the pieces of her life together. Where was her father? What was he doing? Where was her brother David and did she have other brothers and sisters? Forty years later she finally traveled to Stockholm to locate her father, or try to locate her father. Three half-brothers greeted her at the hotel. She quickly asked him, where is David? Referring to her brother. They pointed across the lobby to a man slumped in a chair. Like his father, he had nearly destroyed his life with alcohol. When Aggie asked about her father, her brothers flushed with anger. None of them had talked to him in years. Aggie's half sister arrived at the hotel. All my life I've dreamed about you, she said. I used to spare the map of the world, put a toy car on it, and pretend to drive everywhere to find you. Aggie and her sister went to find their father. They drove to an impoverished area of Stockholm where they entered a run down building and climbed the stairs to the third floor. Inside, liquor bottles lay everywhere. Lying on a bed in the corner was her father, the one-time mystery that never flood. He was now 73 and suffering from diabetes. He had also had a stroke. Cataracts covered both of his eyes. Aggie fell to his side, crying, Daddy, I'm your little girl, the one who left behind in Africa. Tears formed in his eyes. I never meant to give you away. I just couldn't handle both you and your brother. Aggie answered, That's okay, Dad. God took care of me. Her father's faith became tight. God didn't take care of you. He ruined our whole family. He led us to Africa and then he betrayed us. Nothing ever came out of this time. It was a waste, he said to his daughter. A short time before her visit, Aggie received a Swedish magazine article in the mail that told the story of her mother, Sheba, and how many African churches revered, revered her memory. It showed a picture of Siva's grave and told how her life and death had influenced the spread of the gospel in Zaire. Aggie told her father the story so that he could see that her mother had not died in vain. Aggie sang hymns as her mother had done and prayed with him. He broke tears of sorrow and repentance flowed down his face and he committed his life to Christ. Not long after that meeting, David Flood died. 
in her age, learned that his final, in his final days, her father had begun painting scenes of Africa. And in his final hours, delirious, he had begun to speak in Swahili. Before God took him home, he took him back to Africa. Folks, that's what God's love looked like. That's what God's love looked like. That's what God's love looked like. Not long after the meeting, David Flood died. And, 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 and so God took him in the, in the spirit. When visiting London a few years later, Aggie and her husband were introduced to the superintendent of the Pentecost Sons of Zaire, the former Congo. His name was Rugida Degora. With curiosity, Aggie asked, Aggie asked, did you ever know the missionary David and Siva Flood? Yes, he answered. Siva Flood led me to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was just a boy. They had a baby girl, but I don't know what happened to her. Mm -hmm. Aggie cried, I'm that girl, I'm Anita. You see, Rugili was the African boy who sold the chickens mm -hmm. and brought the flood to the fruit. Mm -hmm. He was the only person to come with a sheep of flood and led to Christ. Mm -hmm. From that one boy, thousands of others would reach for Christ. Mm -hmm. And Rugili became a dynamic leader for the gospel of Zaire. Mm -hmm. You see, the love of God is beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. Let's never take it as a light thing. God cared enough about a little boy who sold chickens. God's love never gave up on David Flood, though he became bitter and ran from God much of his life. God's love would not let one of his children, Sheba in particular, die in vain. Through her death, thousands came to Christ. God's love kept egging, and the Holy Spirit led her all of her life. So, that's the love of God. That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Maybe today you're listening and you're overwhelmed with guilt. The Word of God says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So what does God's love look like? It is the look of sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave. Whenever you see sacrifice in action, remember the love of God. It is the look of forgiveness. The Bible says that whosoever believes in him. Do you believe in him this morning? All you need to do is repent. You see, because we're just sinners saved by grace. As I, as I read the Corinthian passage this morning, Paul says, such were some of you. My mind went to that old hymn that we sing, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to die, he took my place. Now I live and breathe in freedom with every step I take. I'm loved and forgiven. I'm back with the living. I'm just a sinner. Sing by grace. So when you leave here today, leave with the joy of the Lord, but never lose the sense of, of what God's love looks like towards you and I, towards us. You see, Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's love. Remember what I began with? What the observer said, what the educator said? You retain 30% of what you hear, 60% of what you hear and see, 80% of what you hear, see, and do. See, it's not enough to hear about God's love. You're here today and you're not right with God. This message will only save you if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How often I have confronted people, and I know most people who do witnessing do that, and you begin to confront them. Oh, yeah, I know all about that. I grew up in this church or that church, and I read my Bible for years. Oh, yeah, I know all. And there's a pride in what they know. And you got to take them on the shoulder and say, It's not what you know, it's what you believe and act on. It's what you believe and act on. It's what you do. What do you do with what you know? What do you do with what you know? What will the plot be like? 
when those who have rejected Christ. There is no word there in the scripture talks about degrees of punishment. There will be degrees of punishment. And what you will have based upon the fact that those who never heard against those who heard and rejected. What will you do when you stand before him and he begins to tell you everything you do? And you miss the salvation. Well, God, I, I thought you wouldn't take me back after I messed up so bad. I'm here to tell you this morning now for time and eternity. That's the lie of the devil. That's the lie of the devil. He took back David Flood. He took back every play. He took back a good many people in this congregation who failed in miserably after you first met him. He's the God of second chance. God's love looks like Jesus Christ. It's not enough for you to, to, to know, hear about God's love. It's not enough for you to see God's love. You must hear, see, and experience God's love for yourself. He's here this morning. Would you bow your heads, please? He's here this morning. In a moment, Pastor Mitchell is going to lead us briefly in that old course. He came to me. When I could not go to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died. He's come to us this morning, church. He's come to remind us of how his love looks. It is not an abstract idea. It's a concrete idea. It is lives changed by the power of God. It is hope where there was hopelessness. It's light where there was death. It's light where there was darkness. That's what God's love looks like. Whether it's in Tammy Faye Tucker, whether it's in David Flood, whether it's in a gross murderer in our midst this morning, or a self-righteous Christian who needs salvation as bad as the murderer, will you, will you receive this one? I just feel and open this hope right now. For anyone here this morning that needs to get back to Lord, gets back to the love of God. I don't know where you're seated. I just know that this morning, especially I've spoken to your heart and life. I'm going to ask the believers to stand. I don't want anybody leaving this building for a moment. I want the believers to stand. I want the Christians to stand, but I want you to pray. And if you're here this morning and you need to get back to God, if you're here this morning and the enemy have lied to you about God's love for you, whether it's that you have, you have sinned too badly or that you've turned your back too badly. This morning the word of God has refuted and put to rest both of those ideas of the enemy of He's coming to us this morning from his word and he's coming to you right where you are on that pew. And all you've got to do is to yield to him and surrender. The evidence of your surrender will be that you will come forward and we can pray with you. We can encourage you. And that's what I want you to do this morning. Say to God, as you pray and as you sing, I want the others to come that need Jesus Christ in a very personal way this morning. Thank you, Jesus.